morning. Earlier this week, we launched a new and improved White House website at www.whitehouse.gov. The new and improved White House website is another important step in our efforts to make government high speed, high tech, and user friendly. We're bringing information that matters into people's homes, policy papers, the citizen's handbook, links to federal agencies. We've also made it easier to find the features that visitors use most, like emailing the White House, taking an online tour, or finding special activities for kids. You just heard a clip from former President Bill Clinton back in 1994, launching the first official White House website and one of the first official government websites in the world. This was back in the early days of the World Wide Web, as we used to call it, and the U.S. government, along with the Canadian government and many other governments around the world in the mid-1990s, were for the very first time bringing information and services onto the World Wide Web, making them accessible to people in a way that was much easier and faster and much more global than ever before. There was a lot of excitement back then, a lot of optimism around what this introduction of new technology into the public sphere and into government could do to improve citizen services, to increase transparency, to increase engagement with citizens. That was almost 30 years ago now. And I think for those of us who are working in this space that we often call digital government today, I don't think it's a stretch to say that many people feel that we have not achieved the ambitions that we would have hoped that we would have been able to this far into this digital journey that we're collectively on as a society. And so it really raises the question as to what's holding us back. What is stopping government and public sector institutions more broadly to be able to harness and take advantage of some of these new technologies, these online ways of working, which in many cases are not actually that new anymore, been around for decades. I'm Ryan Androsif, and you're listening to Let's Think Digital. This is our first episode of this new podcast, which is going to be exploring issues around technology and society and the public good. We'll have a mix of experts coming to join us for group discussions, some one-on-one -on -one interviews, all of them really kind of focused on these issues around how government and the public sector are adapting to the digital world we're in and what we can do to be able to accelerate some of that progress and the barriers that sometimes hold us back from seeing the change that we'd like to see happen. I'm really excited to have a, a great group uh, joining me today uh, of experts and thought leaders in this space. Um, we're going to be joined by Dorothy Eng, uh, Winter Fedek, and Luke Simcoe, who are all associates with Think Digital, but are also um, practitioners who've been involved working in and with government in this digital change arena for many years. So welcome to all of them and really excited to dive into today's conversation. So I'm really excited today to have a, a great group of colleagues and guest speakers joining us to dive into some of these themes a little bit deeper. Excited to introduce to you Dorothy, Winter, and Luke, who are all associates at Think Digital, but also have been exploring the digital government revolution in a first-hand perspective in a number of different ways over the years. Dorothy, maybe I'll go over to you first. Sure. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for uh, for having me. So I'm Dorothy, Executive Director of Code for Canada. We are a mission-driven national nonprofit helping governments to modernize the delivery of public services so that they better meet residents' needs. I am a passionate civic technologist. Prior to this role and, and working at Code for Canada, also worked in kind of large-scale, enterprise-wide um, public sector technology projects at uh, various technology vendors. So have been in the space for a while from, from different angles and different sectors. And uh, yeah, have, have a lot of uh, observations and learnings to ready to dig in with others here. That's great. Uh, Winter, I'll go over to you next. My name is Winter Fedek. I'm a consultant right now who works with the public sector and in, in policy development and uh, delivery support. I've got about 20 years of experience working with governments across Canada. I've worked in Ottawa with the federal government uh, for the public service in Saskatchewan, where I'm based out of right now in Regina. 
and I also do some consulting now with Northern Governments. My interest in uh, digital government kind of came about five or six years ago when I was working in the public service in Saskatchewan and, and was involved in a major project around uh, replacing some aging technology. And at that time, because I don't have any background experience in digital, so I'll just put that caveat out there right now, I'm not a technical person. Um, but I was responsible for, you know, supporting that procurement. And I remember seeing a tweet by Dorothy, actually, and Code for Canada talking about their mission. And I reached out to, through Twitter and said, hey, <laughs> I need some help. I need to, to know what I'm doing here. And so kind of got connected and really interested through that. And then also kind of the design thinking discussions that were happening in the public policy space. So that's kind of where my perspective comes from, from the digital government. That's great. Now we're going to dive into that more uh, for sure. And, uh, and Luke, uh, maybe give a little bit of your background. My name is Luke Simcoe. Uh, I'm really excited for this conversation and, and, and my route into digital government um, starts actually uh, somewhat similar to, to Winter and Dorothy's at, at Code for Canada. So I um, worked there alongside Dorothy and others for about five years trying to sort of change and innovate government from the outside. Um, got really curious about you know um, what it takes to make change happen on the inside and so I'm currently a public servant with the government of Ontario working in change management and service design and you know kind of really trying to tackle the problem from, from all different angles. That's great. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I think I think all three of you bring some very unique, interesting perspectives on on these questions we want to dive into. Um, so in the in the intro for the episode at the beginning, uh, we played a, a clip from from Bill Clinton, who was president in the, in the 1990s, uh, and he was announcing the White House's first website. Uh, which was on October 21st of 1994, way back. Uh, so pop quiz for all of you. Do you know when the government of Canada's first website launched? Anybody want to offer up a guess? It starts well, in the 90s. It would, have been ha it would have had to have been after that. So, like, cause we're always, you know. So that's interesting that you think it would have to be after that. <laughs> so that's why I always feel like, you know, we're always looking scanning scanning globally and seeing what else others are doing and then we're like okay now we'll make them do uh, yeah. I'm curious, maybe two or three years after like 97 that's my opinion. okay so dorothy says 97, 97. yeah yeah, yeah. winter what's your guess <laughs> Uh, I'll guess I'll guess 98, but I will say I remember when Google first hit the public service when I was a public servant, and it was 2001, and my boss came in my office and was like, "Why are you using?" I think it was like the Microsoft one. She's like, "You got to use this new thing called Google." Like I remember this conversation in my office. It was what my first year of working as a public servant, and so I'm super interested to hear the answer to this question. That's awesome, Luke. What's your uh, what's your guess? Well, is it like Price of Right? Price is right rules is it closest without being <laughs> over and so like maybe i'll choose 1995 awesome okay well actually none of you got it bang on but you were all close you were all close it was 1996 1996 <laughs> that was gonna be so my other a, guess yeah exactly so about a year and a half two years afterwards yeah dorothy i think you're right i think we we have this tendency not wanting to be first on a lot of things in canada we're really happy to be second or third but sometimes don't want to don't want to be first on some of these uh uh, new areas. Uh, it was pretty basic. It was it was very very basic. It was like one one GIF and like a couple of like text links, as as a lot of websites were. What was the GIF uh, back in those? It was just like a little like Canada logo, or like not. It, this is this is pre kind of government of Canada wordmark logo, right? So it was just yeah. a a pixelated. I, I not, it like was an spinning, animated one. A spinning maple leaf. Oh, that's too bad. Okay, it wasn't animated. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't one of the animated ones, which were obviously kind of big back in those days on a lot of uh, a lot of those early websites. Um, but you know, what, what's shocking is, I mean, thinking back about this now, I mean, that's pushing thirty years ago, right? So you know, we're we're in two thousand twenty three now, you know, and and I think the U.S. government was, I can't say it was the first government to go on the web, but it was certainly one of the first governments to have an internet presence. And Canada was a couple years behind. You know, so we're over 25 years, pushing 30 years of being in the kind of Internet era of government. And I try to think back a little bit to, to what the expectations were, you know, back then as to, you know, if I kind of put myself back into my 1996, you know, per self, which like full disclosure, I was back in high school at that point, just figuring out what the Internet was myself. You know, I'm, I'm not sure what my conception of what government would look like in 2023 was, but I'm pretty sure it would have been a bit more advanced than what it is today. That's interesting because I mentioned about how I could only access Google in 2001. I would not have been able to have physical access to that website 
Interesting. for a number of years because when I first started government, uh, you know, I remember the senior policy analyst when he was writing briefing notes for, for cabinet for the minister was still writing everything out by hand and having the secretary transcribe everything. And that was in 2001, wow. right? So it take like the thinking about that adoption, it, it's taken a while. And I think we're only now getting to some of those fundamental questions, which is why we haven't advanced yep. in terms of digital government. It takes a long time for mm -hmm. human beings to change, right? So it's, it's a great point, Winter. And, and, well, and, and you do work, you know, up in some jurisdictions, particularly up north, where even today, Internet access isn't always a given, right? I mean, you know, we sometimes can have a very, like, urban perspective on this, but I think you're right. Luke, Dorothy, yeah. curious on your thoughts on, like, you know, if you, if you kind of put yourself in a time warp back, you know, 25, 30 years at the, at the dawn of the Internet era, what you might have thought would be happening three decades in the future. I'm, I'm just imagining that first web page of the government of Canada, and I'm like, the words the internet is a series of tubes and like, <laughs> coming in my head and i i feel like that could still apply to like some of the conversations we uh sometimes have with uh with you know different public sector folks i'm i'm uh i'm you know, trying to be funny here but yeah i think i think in general um you know i th i think honestly if if we yeah like it's, it's easy to also kind of say like uh 30 years ago, would we have thought the government would, you know, um, ha have reached some technological bar that would that would um, align with, you know, our expectations as as citizens? It, it was really even hard back then to really, you know, even imagine that one day we would have like, you know, computers in our pockets that are in the form of smartphones and, yeah. and you know, touch screens and like um, and anything beyond at the time, which was just like, you know, a, a brick. Uh, cell phone was like really, really, really big like advancement. So it is, it is actually kind of crazy when you think about um, like how fast like technology in general has moved. And I think actually thinking of that scale of timeline and how fast things have moved um, really helps to like bring back like some humility, right? That like actually it, it does make yep. it kind of makes sense that like you know organizations that were designed or institutions that were designed for you know, forever, like government, um, to change at that kind of pace is, uh, is, is, is extremely difficult. <laughs> Yeah. And you know what, Dorothy, it, it's a great point on, I mean, on the organizational side, but I'm also thinking on the human side as well. I mean, 30 years on the one hand is a long time, but it's not, it's not centuries, right? And, and winter a little bit to what you were sharing, you know, your anecdote when you joined into government the first time, like there's a lot of people now in kind of senior management positions in government who didn't grow up or start their careers, you know, in the internet era, right? We're still on that bubble right now yeah. where a lot of kind of, I would say, the senior leadership in government actually comes from the pre-internet era. I guess I kind of want to put on my change management hat and like part of doing that well is about celebrating wins. And I, and I think it's, it's, it's disingenuous to suggest that we haven't moved past the like website with the, you know, the, the GIF maple leaf, you know, kind of thing. I think, you know, we have made strides. There's lots you can do. I'd say like, a lot of that has come probably in the last decade, more so than the sort of mm -hmm. 20 years, you know, if we're talking a 30 year timeline, you know, I think, um, yep. you know, it, it, it's, that change has happened more recently than perhaps it should have. So it really is to Dorothy's point about pace. And then I think, so we're, we're not in like a is government online, you know, era anymore. That's well past us. Government is definitely online. You know, I can renew my driver's mm -hmm. license and, you know, whatnot online. I can file my taxes online. You know, I can do that stuff. I think we're now more in an era of like, how good is that experience? Yeah. Right. And again, like if, if you think about the last decade, you think of things like user experience design and product management. And those are disciplines and ideas and ways of thinking about technology that are actually pretty new. It's interesting, like, again, kind of thinking back on the history of this, you know, in the early days of what people kind of called e-government. I mean, Canada was viewed as a world leader around this. Yeah. Right. Um, the U.N. has their e-government rankings that they put out um, and they, you know, in the early days, um, uh, their very first one, which was in 2003, we were sixth in the world. We were actually at a high of third in the world in 2010 since over the last decade and a bit. The, the latest UN ranking that came out, and I think there's probably open questions around the methodology that are worth talking about, but we're at 32 on, on, on the index now, you know, down from a high of three. And I don't think it's, personally, I don't think it's that we've gotten worse. 
I think it's that others have improved a bit faster than we have. And, yeah. and, and Luke, I'm just, I was thinking a little bit about your comment, too, around, you know, people's comparison to other services they might get, you know, from the private sector or from, from online. And to me, that whole kind of expectations piece is a big part of this, right? There's, some of you may be familiar with this definition of digital, which I love to use. Uh, it comes from Tom Lusmore, who was one of the co-founders of uh, GDS in the UK, um, part of Public Digital now. And, and he has this definition he, uh, where he says digital is the application of the culture practices, processes, and technologies of the internet era to respond to people's raised expectations, right? And I, I always love using that definition because I think it kind of sets up this two-sided equation that on the one hand, yeah, 100% people's expectations are increasing, I think, faster than that pace of change, certainly in public sector organizations, is keeping up with it. So there's that gap that's growing. Even though, as I think a lot of you have said, probably objectively speaking, government's getting better at digital, but it may not be getting better as fast as the expectations of the citizens who are accessing it, or the employees, frankly, who are in the organizations. <laughs> Government was not set up to necessarily be structured and work in those kind of ways. Well, and yes and no, I, like Canada is a federal government, right? A federal country. And that really impacts, I think, how digital government expresses itself in this country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about that real shift. When did that real shift happen? I think for me, it was that question around uh, uh, user design that Luke brought up, right? And user experience, because then government started to think about public value. And that's where the question of digital government gets really messy, especially in a federal system like ours, where you've got various levels of government responsible for for providing those services to citizens. So the closer that you get to the citizen, the municipality, the province, the territory, you know, their access to those technological resources uh, that would give them the capacity to provide those services at a level that Canadians would expect is vastly different than where the federal government is at in terms of their uh, digital capacity. So what I what I you know, when I see, you hear those stats about Canada kind of decreasing, I think that's part of the genesis of it is around these questions of jurisdiction and mm -hmm. resource levels and how that varies so, so widely across Canada. I mean, as you mentioned, the high speed that you're going to get in uh, Kugluktuk, Nunavut is going to be very different than what you're getting in downtown Toronto or Ottawa. Yet that's where public policymakers are primarily, and yep. that's their frame of reference for building these things out, right? So those are very some of specific the locational choices, Winter. <laughs> <laughs> or Vancouver, you know, um, some of those major centers. But um, uh, it, it is it's, it, th that variability is something yep. that I, don't, I think we don't talk enough about. I'm a little optimistic on that front, right? If you if you go to the digital government conferences and you and you talk to folks, there's a there's been a push for kind of like shared open source tooling and kind of and a, and, and a growing acknowledgement that higher orders of government might have a responsibility of building like open tools that can be repurposed at a low cost for, for governments to need them. If you look at some of the work, you know, around common platforms that the Canadian Digital Service is doing and the government digital service in the UK, uh, the Beck Center, right, is doing research about this in the United States. And so mm -hmm. there's something kind of there when we talk about that federated kind of system of like, is it time to acknowledge that maybe it's actually the federal government of Canada's responsibility to like build like, I don't know, a vaccine registration platform as just a, you know, an apropos example, right? And then be able to ship that as open source code down to other, you know, kind of levels of government who may, who may need to, to make use of that, of that service, right? It's really interesting, Luke. It's making me think, you know, to this whole discussion around like a federal system and the, and at least in a Canadian specific model, how it works here. You know, we often kind of think about, I mean, the way our division of powers work, a lot of the kind of like meat and potatoes on the ground services are the responsibilities of the province, things like health and education that, you know, impact people's daily lives. And, and often that kind of transaction between the feds and the provinces just comes down to writing a check, right? And a lot of those, you know, federal provincial conferences are about how what how much money is going. And I kind of I was really struck actually a few weeks ago in the context of um, the healthcare funding discussions that are happening right now between the federal government and provincial government. The federal government was actually saying, listen, you know, one of the things we learned from COVID was we've got really bad health data across the country. It's very spotty, makes it tough for us to be able to do good public health responses. So one of the conditions the federal government's trying to put into new funding rounds for health is that we need to be able to get good quality data from the provinces coming forward. And there's been some pushback on it, but it makes me wonder as digital becomes so embedded in what government does, maybe the flip side is the provinces say, listen, we're going to actually demand 
we need open source code from the feds. I mean, that'd be actually pretty interesting if we kind of say yeah. beyond just pure like monetary flows between federal and provincial governments, maybe we start talking about data and code and technology being these like common assets that there's from one direction or the other, right? The provinces are expecting the feds to be able to provide, you know, a core set of tools that everybody can use. The feds may say we expect, you know, common data from provinces so we can actually take a national picture. There's a whole interesting thread, which is probably worth a podcast episode in and of itself around what I might call internal barriers that have kind of slowed down, you know, government's ability to dive into this. And all of us have worked in government or with governments. We've seen this. And and this was actually um, the inspiration for a workshop that the four of us ran uh, back in November at Forward 50, which is the big digital government conference here in Canada that gets run every Every year um, up in Ottawa um, and we did a workshop on identifying digital government barriers um, and as part of that we used what I, what I call the Pac-Man model of, of kind of peeling back the layers of the onion of, of what can sometimes slow things down and the the 30 second praises of it is you know there's the the old saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast which I think we kind of all agree having a, a, a culture that enables the change you want kind of trumps having a strategy document sitting somewhere but this notion that there's also the layers around the incentives in your organization and the structures of your organization you know how decisions are made kind of the governance question that ultimately kind of dictate your ability to make progress or not and you know and my my thesis kind of is that we actually in the digital government world haven't spent that much time thinking about structures and incentives um, and and I think that's kind of held us back in some ways but Luke maybe maybe I might just turn to you for a minute because you you had taken on the, the the task of kind of writing a bit of a summary you know blog post based on you know the, the kind of hundred plus opinions we heard from people in that workshop I mean curious you know maybe to get you to kick us off in some of the big themes that we kind of heard heard coming out of that workshop session and then maybe you know winter and dorothy can pick up on that yeah well i think it was a fascinating workshop um it was really great to connect with folks and and something that i i really enjoyed was sort of midway through we pivoted from kind of identifying blockers to trying to sort of co-design solutions and um i'm always happier to end there than like here is everything that's wrong uh, <laughs> you know um yep. and so um, yeah, so you know, I think if you if you're listening and, and or watching and you're working in the space, I, I don't think the findings will shock you, you know. But I think this is the point, right? We've all kind of been like butting our heads against the same problems, perhaps for too long, right? So you know, you heard lots of things about broad, you know, risk aversion, and you know, government doesn't want to take risks, you know, prefers a working service that is subpar to you know the risk of a improved but not working service and you know and and, and things like that. Um, definitely, you know, heard the common refrain about talent. Right. And I think this speaks to that that idea. Yeah. Some of these disciplines, they're very new. Right. So there's not a ton, you know, of people, you know, skilled, skilled up in them. And then it's become increasingly sort of challenging for, for government to attract and, and, and retain folks with the right sort of skills needed to be able to deliver on people's raised expectations. Right. Um, and that's, a, you know, a big challenge. Um, even even when you recruit people, they don't always stay. Um, and Dorothy can talk very elegantly about this. This is very much a, you know, a, a lot of learning around what makes people come and what makes people go um, has come out of the work of Code for Canada. And so maybe, you know, you can you can dive deeper into that. Um, and then the last one is like a big like the to speaking to structures and incentives. Right. Um, you know, I think there's a really big conversation to be had about kind of how the incentives of the political class trickle down in to become the incentives of the public service and whether or not, you know, that that's appropriate for, for some of what we're trying to do, like fearless advice, loyal in, implementation, where are we in that, in that balance is always a, a question. And then um, st- structures around decision making, in particular funding, right? When you combine that kind of risk averse piece with, with you know, the kind of oversight and accountability of government, it becomes very hard to fund like experiments, right? Which are sort of key, I think, to working in new digital ways. We're going to try something, we're going to learn about it, we're going to see if it makes sense. If it works, we're going to keep doing it. If it doesn't work, we're going to do something else. And, yep. and it's very hard. There are, there are no templates for funding proposals, you know, for that necessarily in government. Yep. Or at least there are a few templates. Like definitely people are, are trying in pockets, yep. but in general, you may not get funding if you tell someone, I don't know what the end product is going to be. So... Yeah, no, I mean, definitely funding processes in government uh, prioritize certainty 
uh, even if it's false certainty, uh, it's, they still want that sense that the whole thing is planned out ahead of time. And, and I, w I would just add, Luke, the ability to scale up innovations, the work, I think, is something the government really struggles with. I mean, even where you do see pilot projects that happen, it's really rare in my, in my view that that pilot project actually gets scaled up and, and becomes something or that becomes stops. streamed. Or right, stops if it doesn't yeah, work. Right? Yes. There's a lot of like, it, it, the, we, there tends to be a lot of sunk costs, you know, in that, oh, we, we're putting forward an MVP or a prototype, but it's really just the thing you were going to do anyway. Yep. And there's no, and like people mentioned this, right? There, there isn't a way to kind of, we don't know how to stop doing things, right? And, and, and like, fair enough. Like, I understand the optics of that, right? You know, from a very simplistic kind of naive perspective, it sounds like you wasted money. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. The, yeah, the the headline test on it is tricky, right? And yeah. kind of that, but in that public media environment, D Dorothy, did uh, want you, you want to pick up on any of this, including the talent piece, which, I, as Luke said, I know is something the Code for Canada spends a lot of time thinking about as to how to bring in and retain talent in government. Yeah, I mean, just just some background, like uh, Code for Canada. A lot of our work uh, revolves around this model of embedding, recruiting, you know, tech and design talent, often from the private sector. Um, these are folks who are, you know, quite skilled at their craft, their their digital, um, their digital craft, whether it's like software development or UX design or product management. And often these people really just want to work on projects that have an impact, right? That are going to uh, benefit their communities, society as a whole, which is really government's mandate. So we will embed embed these folks into teams within government to essentially approach problems and projects, and often these are technology projects, in a different way, right? So they'll, they'll bring in, um, you know, the modern digital tools and practices that they're, they're quite used to using and, and quite proficient in, uh, into the public sector. And, and really each of these projects ends up being a bit of um, an experiment, right? Often what we find is, you know, there's, there's like, with any kind of new role, new project, new initiative, there's a lot of you know excitement that builds up in the beginning, and you know if we're looking at like a, a graph, I'm using my hand to motion this for those listening, it's like it's like going up, 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 up a mountain, and then um, you know it's like there's always that that's the honeymoon phase, right? And then um, uh, there might be a lot of in in those moments, maybe there are blockers that these teams come across, where it's like, hey, can I have access to this system? No, or <laughs> like or it's, or it's like. Sure, but you know, like put it log log a ticket. It's going to take six months or whatever. Um, and so there's it's it's almost like the the excitement and the patience reaches um, uh, an upper limit, and then things slowly start to come down, right? Where it's like, okay, well, how do how do we how do we make progress, um, or how do we create the change that we that we all aim to 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 create, right? That's remember that was like the outcome that we were aiming for, and it sounds bad, and things start to. <laughs> to crash maybe but then it reaches like a bottom point and then things slowly start to climb again where then you know actually that's where that that's actually the beautiful part where like all i think all uh teams are kind of empathizing with each other right that actually wait a minute like doing this kind of change is it's not going to happen overnight or or within like you know six months 12 months even a few years like it takes a long time and because a lot of these habits and behaviors are just built in and, and reinforced by the structure and the system as, we, as we've um, covered off in the Pac-Man model, right? So um, I think, it, and, and, but then when that, you know, humility and empathy starts to <laughs> build and like we start now coming back on the rebound, um, that's, I think that's when we start to find some of the, the really um, important building blocks that slowly start to yep. shape, that, that help to slowly to, um, move the needle on the culture, right? Whether that is things like, um, well, what is, what is risk aversion? What are we perceiving as risk? Um, you know, and, and, and what is the impact of that? And, and actually asking those hard questions, right? I think the, the thing there though, is that, that that's a timeline, right? That obviously, as I mentioned, takes a while. And so a lot of people don't have patience for that timeline. And so they might exit at any one of those moments before you get to that sweet spot at the end. Winter, I'm curious from your perspective, anything that really jumped out for you from the from the 450 workshop that we ran? Yeah, oh, there's there's just so much. It's hard to kind of nail it down. Uh, I'm thinking about, you know, so, <clears throat> digital transformation, you know, in my experience, it, it surfaces some of those questions that have always been a tough nut to crack for any policy analyst. 
Um, the first one, I think, is the most important one, and often we skip it over as public servants, is, you know, who is the customer? Who are we serving here? And really understanding um, who that customer is and whether or not they even need a digital service in the first place, right? Like the, some of those 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 primary kind of questions, we often skip that over because we've given we've been given direction, you will do this. So we take it and we run and we do what we're told because it's, you know, fearless advice, loyal implementation, as, as kind of Luke mentioned. Um, but but in that process, we do skip over some of those really fundamental questions that I think really help to provide clarity later on in the process that help to create, um, that give you, give you a bit of a tool to break through some of those log jams when you're having different teams in an organization kind of butt heads a little bit about, what do you mean you want my data? I haven't had to share my data out in, in any format other than I choose for 30 years. You know, if information is power, what we're asking teams and organizations to do is give up a little bit of their power. And, you yep. know, that doesn't always go very well. So some of these are the, the, the kind of early questions that, um, you know, you really need to dig into to help to, to help solve some of those later problems that you're going to have. And just the, the pace of change and the way that government works, we don't always get to, to have those conversations, but but those are really critical conversations uh, to have. Because a lot of the things that were surfaced, I mean, at the, the, the Forward 50 conference, it was very validating for me to kind of come together with, you know, some of the, the you know, most passionate minds in Canada, really, on the questions of digital government and have this conversation and see what those themes are. Um, and what some of those solutions could be. Kind of what mm -hmm. what stuck with me a bit, right, is that there was a lot of unity and like shared understanding and validation around the problems, um, but there wasn't like perhaps for obvious reasons there wasn't like that same level of like clarity and alignment around solutions. Yeah. Right. So we're very much in a moment where we totally know what the problems are, right. And we're still throwing stuff at the wall to see sort of like, you know, what will fix it. And I think that speaks to the value of the Pac-Man model, right? We like, oh, we can fix it by fixing the culture, right? Cool. How do you even do that, right? What, how do you touch culture? What levers do you pull, right? And, and so now I think that's why I find the incentives and, and structures piece so important because it's clear that culture eat strategy for breakfast hasn't worked. Right. We've like we've known these problems for a number of years and it's time to move up, you know, uh, up the model a bit and start thinking about how to incentivize the kinds of activities and behaviors, you know, that, that lead to, to digital success. Right. And where, you know, the, the structures around decision making need to change as well. And, and I think we can begin to see that. But I, I find that the, that model really helpful because my belief is that you can't change culture. Culture isn't something you can touch right? It, it emerges from things like incentives and structures and how you make decisions and how you hire and who you hire and, yeah. you know, all those things. So you have to do all this other stuff to change culture, right? You can't just say, we need to have a culture of this, therefore, right? And, and frankly, that's something, you know, that, that I've encountered and more so probably when I was working as a consultant or at Code for Canada, you'd go into governments that had said, oh, like, you know, we're agile now. Right. Agile is part of our culture. Right. And then you'd ask what changed and nothing changed. <laughs> right. Just the use of the word. Right? Yep. And so I think we that's where like culture told us what words to use. But in actually to make those words real, we need to begin to move to incentives and, and, and structures, I think. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the one thing I just wanted to add, Luke, was I, I think you're 100 percent right. The people who were in that room, you know, who kind of live and breathe digital government, I think they've got a shared understanding of what what some of the problems are. But I'm not sure that's as true across public sector in general, let alone if you get the public involved. Right. And a little bit to some of what Winter and and Dorothy and others were talking about. I, I actually think there's a challenge for those in the digital government community to build empathy even internally with their colleagues, you know, who may not have been as fully immersed in this. You know, because my, my, my theory is that, you know, 99% of people don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I'm going to be obstructionist. I want to kind of stop things from, you know, happening or stop progress. It's, you know, they've got their own set of incentives and structures that they're working under. And I think part of the work, and it's tough work, that hasn't been done as much as it needs to be is understanding their perspective and bringing them along. And, and, and you know, kind of there's both kind of an outreach, but there's a little bit of almost an internal negotiation that has to happen to kind of get people to understand how, why this 
context matters and how it can make you know their work or their lives better. Um, so there's, I think there's some really interesting kind of change management type work yeah. that, that in my view, you know, has to happen over the coming years if we're going to see some of that progress. Yeah, 100%. Um, you can't just have the better argument. Right. I think that's, yeah, that's something yeah, that I've exactly. noticed in the digital government space was like the strategy is delivery. Right. Which is like a mantra. Mm -hmm. Right. Has its limits because you were like, look, we delivered something better. Don't you all want to do this? And then people were like, well, maybe not. So there's yep. something more, you know, that, that needs to happen. Well, right? and that, I think that's the secret we weapon of public sector organizations versus private sector organizations and the question of, of transformation is that we serve the public. So as long as as that remains our North Star and, and the question about why are we doing this, what value are we adding, you can always trace it back to that Canadian at the end of the at the end of that rope, that digital chain, who we're, you know, we're doing this for. That helps you to break through a lot of those internal barriers that you might encounter because then you can say to that program analyst, I'm sorry. You have to give us this data because this is what we're trying to do and this is the value it's going to bring for this end user, this Canadian. And it also helps you then to explain to decision makers, this is why we're doing uh, what we're doing in a way that speaks their language, right? So that's the trick I think for, especially when you're in a large public sector organization is to really kind of, you know, that's where I'm saying that work at the front end that needs to happen around the, the why, right? Like start with why. Um, and laser focusing on the the value proposition for that Canadian is is you know it's a tough work but like I said I think it's it's our secret weapon in the sense it's going to help us bust through a lot of those barriers that you wouldn't have in some other organizations. Can I think there's something really important to note based on what Winter said, and I think it gets to this this is this is the challenge and this is where actually it transcends the public service and begins I think to get in, into political leadership right. Um, the incentives aren't always the same like the incentives and the structures around serving the resident at the end of the day aren't always there right if you're optimizing for cost per transaction. That's different than optimizing for how successful someone can complete that transaction transaction and how quickly. Right. Mm -hmm. So we actually need to think about what we're measuring and how we're what we're rewarding. Right. Because those things are sometimes, frankly, in, in intention. Right. Yep. And even at a very existential level, I think user centered government and sort of like Westminster democracy are a little tiny bit intention. Right. We can go to people and have direct access to like through user research and things like that to what they want. Right. And that's very different from politicians as proxies for the public and, and po the policies that politicians pursue being the will of the people, right? So that's like a fundamental, massive existential thing that we do not have time for at all today. Yeah, but I was going to say, Luke, it's not a little bit of tension. I think it's a lot of tension. I, I think this is I think this is worth a, a podcast discussion by itself because I think there is uh, tension between our existing democratic system of government, particularly our kind of very vertical Westminster system of accountability we have in Canada, and user-centered agile approaches, yeah, right? Um, and, I, and I think the, the notion of what is the role of elected officials versus public servants in this new digital government world we're moving into, where we're trying to say public servants shouldn't just be cogs in a machine, but the flip side is public servants as individuals don't have democratic accountability in the same way elected yeah. officials do. So there's there's a ton to kind of unwrap around this, which I think we, uh, the, uh, as, as a promo for future ones, we will get into it more. But yeah, and the role of Canadians, public servants, politicians, and Canadians ourselves, and we are yep. all Canadians sitting here. We yep. need to be explicit about what we want from our governments because they respond. Politicians will respond. But... You know, we don't know what we don't know. We don't, you know, how can you want something you don't you don't know that exists? And so it's tough for Canadians to really articulate that. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. Well, and just on this theme of going forward, I think this is a great kind of like last question I wanted to throw out to all of you. You know, we started this discussion looking backwards and we kind of talked about 25, 30 years ago, you know, kind of the origins of government in the Internet era and, and where we are today. I, I'm curious to get your thoughts looking forward into the future and maybe 25 or 30 years is too far of a time horizon. Maybe let's think 10 years if we're kind of thinking what the world's going to look like in the early 2030s. What's, I'd be curious just very quickly to get a sense of what's each of your kind of ambitions as to what you would kind of love to see government have, having been able to accomplish in this kind of digital government realm, you know, over the next decade. Um, Dorothy, maybe I'll start with you. You know, what do, what, what do you see as kind of top of your list of, as what you hope to kind of this next decade will bring? I spent a lot of time reading about uh, 
diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, you know, creating environments, organizations, cultures that uh, allow like everybody to bring them full self, their, their full self to work. And so, what and what does that mean? It means you know, there's psychological safety, and and really inherently there's trust between b between people within an organization, all working towards a common goal of, in this case, you know, better services that deliver real value yep. to, to Canadians or end users. Um, and I think that like, you know, when, when all, all these things that, that we've just been talking about, about like, you know, incentives, disincentives, rewards, uh, like structure, all, all the way down to culture, I think that that basis of trust is, is essentially what's lacking, right? Because it's like, you look at what it, what do you, what are people, what are certain groups incentivized for versus disincentivized for, and that doesn't align with other groups. And so this is why it's, it's, everything's all over the place. And, and, and then, and then all this risk and risk aversion starts to bubble up, bubble up everywhere. And I mean, I feel really hopeful because what I've, what I've noticed is that this space of like, you know, it's still super nascent, the, the space of, of DEI and the research there and, and building like healthy organizations. It, it's slowly maturing or it, it's slowly growing, first of all, and then and then it's slowly maturing. And I think there is a ton of opportunity to for, for governments in general to start um, learning about this space and actually building that within within teams starting at the grassroots level and then starting mm -hmm. to you know trickle i'm hope i'm hoping you know towards structural change um because because we can see it like slowly starting to happen right like when we think about i mean going back to the beginning like with you talked about wins that are happening across governments across canada like there there are wins and i i feel strongly that those wins are happening because the leaders there are creating those spaces those like pockets where trust is like the, you know the foundation and then everything else can happen on top of that it's 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 giving me this thought of like trust being the superpower for government transformation so actually for at, at the team level absolutely luke thoughts from you on kind of what what your ambition would be for for 10 years from now what government looks like just a quick plus one to like psychological safety for public servants right like the mantra of the digital government movement is the small empowered team and you need that to happen right and there's a lot you know that's not for as much as people say it it, it's not present nearly enough, I, I, I think, in government. Um, personally, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna uh, crib from something I hear um, Sid Harrell say a lot, which is like, my hope for the next ten years is nothing new until everything works. Um, right? You know, I the thing that keeps me up at night is that we're gonna spend the, these next ten years talking about blockchain and the metaverse and big data and AI and all this stuff, and we should be talking about that. And we ought to be thinking about how the public sector can leverage that. But those shiny things distract from the fact that the forms are still terrible, right? And so, like, I would love it if ten years from now we have sort of the same level of technology, but just the forms work and the user experience works and it's kind of easy to log in and it's easy to find information and the content on the website is in plain language and like all of these sorts of things, um, you know, are really what excite me. Like the least exciting things I think are the most exciting. And I'd love us to spend some time on that instead of like getting distracted by people who want to lead giant transformations and all these sorts of things and just kind of fix the, fix all that low hanging fruit. Because I think that's where that, to put trust in the other direction, like that's where we're gonna get trust from residents is that like, oh, the form is pretty easy to fill out and it all made yeah. sense and I found what I needed on the website. They don't really care as nearly as much about whether or not there's a distributed ledger with their health information on it. You know, like yeah. that feels too big for 10 years. I, I want us to think small. Yeah, no, and, and it's and I think kind of getting those like plumbing issues fixed, as you said, they aren't the sexiest ones, but they are so incredibly important. But it's tough because I think governments have to have this two track mind because you do have to. I mean, I, I would argue you do have to at least be aware of these big technology trends coming down the pipe because then you can get blindsided with the change. But but it's very easy to get sucked into shiny object syndrome where that's all you're doing and not fixing the issue that's been persistent well, for 20 years. And right? it's, an in, it's an incentive thing. Like it's, there's no, it makes sense that we started this podcast with Bill Clinton announcing the government's first website. That is a big, sexy, announceable, yes. you know, it checks all the boxes for the incentives for both the political class and, you know, and others. The person who designed that website got promoted to be a deputy minister. I know they don't, they don't have those exactly in the States, but you know what I mean? You know, all that stuff, right? Like those, but like, we made it a little easier to like, you know, find your health card 
on the website is not like a cool announceable that gets a press release. And so that's where we have some of that misalignment, I think, within yeah. in, in yeah. this, right? Great point. Winter, uh, final word to you. With 10 years out, what's your, what's your hope ambition for, for government in the digital era? I'm a two-track mind on this. Uh, some days I'm a bit of a nihilist on the whole question, to be really honest with you. And I wonder if a lot of this question around digital government is intellectual masturbation while the world burns. You know, and we outsource our major digital communication platform to a billionaire and we have uh, wars being fought with digital digital technology that I had, you know, you can't even fathom. Um, and yet we're not, you know, but yet we're talking about forms, which I totally 100% agree with that, right? So this is where it's like I oscillate between these two wild extremes of, you know, what's the point <laughs> at this point in time anyway? Sometimes it feels like, you know, what is the point? At other times, I do. I think that there's so much potential to really think through some of these fundamental questions and do some really important stuff with it, you know, and I will go to that big shiny thing. One of the things I would love us, you know, you talked about that idea around the federal government creating that uh, technological platform and, and, and uh, sub, you know, sub-national governments kind of being obligated to exchange data for that. I think that that could be so powerful for the welfare state in Canada, which is our identity, right? So, um, but I also think that could give citizens an interesting level of control. Like I would like to see, this is my crazy, my crazy dream. If anybody out there is listening and has the opportunity to make this happen, I want to be in control of my data and I'll give it to the government in exchange for lower taxes, right? On my income tax, you can say, Winter, did you, did you give government all of your data that you collect because I own all my data, so it's all in this box, right? And if data is the new oil, I'll get to decide whether or not uh, the prime minister or my premier or my mayor gets to have access to it. And in exchange, I get compensated for that. So something wild and crazy, like I think we need to have some of those wild and crazy ideas. At the same time, on a daily basis, we need to work to, towards excellence uh, in digital government. So, you know, that in 10 years, oh, it's a tough question, but I, I hope we've done something really important with it because I think you know, this is a critical time in in, uh, in Canada's history, and I hope that we've made some progress in 10 years on that question. Are we going to, like, uh, take bets now? And then <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, hopefully hopefully, the Let's Think no. Digital podcast is still going strong 10 years from now, and we can do, uh, we'll, we'll do a reunion episode and see how our bets uh, played out. I like that. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much. This has been, I mean, it's been an excellent conversation, and I think the mark of any good conversation is it leaves you with more questions at the end than you had coming in, and that's certainly true for my end. So thanks so much for being part of this, and uh, no doubt we will have you back on in future episodes as we kind of peel back some of these other issues in further depth. So thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, thanks Ryan. Cool. Thank you so much. So I really enjoyed that conversation. I, I think it gets to the heart of a lot of the big issues that you know people are thinking about or talking about or concerned about in digital government circles around how we're actually able to take these institutions that in many cases, you know, based on processes and rules and ways of working that go back decades, if not centuries, and be able to bring them into the modern age. Um, you know, my thesis behind a lot of this, as we've talked about, has been that for too long, you know, we focused just around putting in place strategies. Uh, maybe we talk about culture change a bit, but without really a clear idea about how to actually impact that. And I passionately believe that as we move into the years ahead, we're really going to have to start focusing on the incentives and structures of our organizations in the public sector if we want to see them modernize in a substantive way. And the reality is that's going to take political will. It's going to take public pressure. Uh, it's going to take people having conversations like this a thousand times over to be able to, to build up the interest and ideas and momentum to be able to see these very large organizations that tend to resist change be able to move and modernize. And, and I'm hopeful that we're at the beginning of this process and that we can see in the coming decades some substantive changes around how we're actually structuring our, our public sector and government organizations to be able to be adaptable and 
and be effective in today's reality. So thanks so much for for joining us for this conversation. A big thank you to Dorothy, Winter, and Luke uh, for taking the time to to talk today. I think that you know this was a, a really great kind of first episode to lay the groundwork for a number of the themes that we're going to have a chance to to unpack in future podcast episodes that uh, you'll be seeing in in the coming weeks and months. Um, on that, you know, if you like what you've just heard, uh, please, we'd love to get your help to to get the word out. Um, you know, please give us uh, a review, hopefully, a, hopefully a positive five star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and be sure to, to share the link for the podcast with anybody in your network who you think might be interested. Um, our website for the podcast is letsthinkdigital.ca. You can find the podcast and links to all of the podcasting sites that we're on from there. Um, we're also up on YouTube and we're doing video versions of these podcasts as well. Um, and so you can visit our YouTube channel, which is also Let's Think Digital on YouTube, uh, and be able to view the, uh, the video versions uh, of our podcast and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified when we load new episodes up on there. Um, and finally, we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, if you have ideas on topics you'd like for us to cover, on guests you'd like us to interview, or feedback on what you've heard or on the episodes, please reach out to us. You can email us at podcast at thinkdigital.ca. Let's Think Digital was produced by myself, our, our podcast producer, Wayne Chu, and our communications assistant, Mel Han. So a big thanks to everybody who's part of the team that's pulling this together. Um, and thank you for listening. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time, and let's keep thinking digitally. Digitally.